I'm going to introduce our next speaker. He's a California guy, Dr. Matt Ritter, grew up in Mendocino County. Nice beaches. He's earned a bachelor's degree in microbiology from uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara, and he received his PhD <laughs> in plant biology at University of California, San Diego. He's a botany professor in the biological sciences department at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. He's got a wife and two kids, and I'm really jealous because I thought I was a published author, but he's more published than I am. Please help me welcome Dr. Matt Ritter. Thank you, Tom. Can you all hear me okay? All right, well, um, Thank you, Tom, for the introduction. Thank you all for uh, inviting me out here to speak. Tom said, uh, I'm a California guy. That's true. I'm a, I'm a seventh generation Californian and have spent, I, well, I'm, I'm living the botany life and living the, the life of a, of a botany professor. You, you all don't know me very well, so I'm just going to do a, a, a little introduction. I um, have been a botany professor at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo for 20 years. And I work a lot with the Western chapter of the International Society of Arboriculture. Some of you may have even come out to California to take a workshop I've given. I've given hundreds of workshops. And what I do is I translate the science of trees to uh, people who work on trees. Uh, and, and for the tree care industry, I write books. I've written a number of books about trees uh, and plants in general. I also write novels and um, um, which is, it turns out is a bad idea if you're interested in making any money. It's, uh, um, and I'm saying that joke for Tom, as he knows. Uh, my actual expertise is in eucalyptus trees and I go around the world looking at eucalyptus trees and helping people identify them. They're the world's most commonly planted trees. And so um, they have issues with that genus outside of Australia. All of them are from Australia, but they plant them all over the world. And so people are very interested in eucalyptus trees. Um, as a botany professor, I get to interact with 18 to 22 year olds uh, and try to help them get interested in trees and forests and natural history and conservation. And uh, I really feel like I'm, I'm living the dream. It hasn't been the dream, I'll be honest, over the last couple of years uh, when you're talking to a bunch of 18-year-olds uh, who are mostly apathetic on a little black box. But other than that, it's been great until then. And, and like Dr. Wolf said, I'm really happy to be back in a room with people who um, are interested in learn about trees and plants. And so, um, I'll uh, going to switch gears from what the talk was earlier, and I'm going to get into uh, some science of how trees develop and how branches form. And um, I'm going to give the talk in a slightly different way in the sense that if you want to yell out and, um, and interrupt me while I'm talking, I'm totally fine with that. And I, and I would encourage it. And probably if I'm saying something that you don't, don't understand, that means like 90% of the people in the room don't understand it. So you're doing everybody a favor by, by uh, asking questions. We can ask questions afterward, but I have this, I have a talk planned and I'm fine getting interrupted with it. That's, that's it's all good. And so uh, in our boar culture, we use so many words that either make sense or don't make sense that um, describe variation in branching in trees and the way trees work and things like double leaders and lateral branches and narrow crotches and stubs and sprouts and suckers and all these words that we use to describe when you look at a tree and you look at the, the branching pattern of a tree and what, um, what is actually happening there. Well, all of these actually have some sort of plant morphology behind them, some way of understanding what is actually going on at the level of the way the plant works. And, and so um, I thought I'd deep dive into that with you and we'll go into that and to understand how does the actual tree form? How do you get the formation of a massive trunk from a teeny little sapling? And that's a redwood sapling on the left. It's a 
fake redwood sapling where I added the roots, but that redwood sapling would look very similar to that and, and, and give that thing a couple thousand years and it becomes a massive, massive thing. And so in, in order to talk about how trees form, we have to talk about what's go going on on the branch tips and then the transition from what's going on on the branch tips to, to, to trunks getting wider and wider and, and, and how that happens. There are three major seasonal growth patterns in plants in the, world, in the world. How many plants are there? How many plant species are there in the world? Well, the answer is about 300,000, give or take. 300,000 species of plants, give or take 25, 30,000, 10% off in one direction or the other. And of those 300,000, you can put them all in three categories in which they have this seasonal, some kind of seasonal growth pattern. And uh, the, the first, we, we, when you talk about trees, you know the things that aren't trees. These are what we call annuals. This is about 10% of all plants in the world, all plant species in the world, grow and die in a single year. And uh, annuals, these are herbaceous plants. They, uh, they usually germinate sometime in spring when conditions get good. They grow throughout the year, set seeds in the fall and, uh, and die in the early winter. And I'm saying seasons there because seasonality is really important for the annual, annual growth pattern. This is the Carrizo Plain in the eastern portion of San Luis Obispo County in the county that I live in. And um, grasslands like this or wildflower fields or meadows or prairies, these are all composed of these annual type plants. And the seed, which trees make, obviously as well, is an awesome adaptation for dealing with harsh environments. The seed can wait and it can travel through time and space. It can just sit there and wait for the right conditions. And this is what these plants are doing. They're surviving the harsh eight months of no rain in the form of a seed. The plant is there, the next generation is there in the seed and it just sits and waits. And some of them wait years and years and years. And in California, where we have fire ecology, and, and there are plants that won't germinate until after a fire. In fact, they can sit there in the soil for 30 years and germinate only after a fire happens. So when that plant germinates, it's actually its 31st year of its life. It just sat there for 30 years at, at the soil waiting for the right conditions. So those, those are annuals. There's a rare group of plants called biennials. They're not even 1% of all the species of plants in the world. And those are, uh, there's a couple famous ones like the carrot. That means growing and uh, their entire life cycle taking place in two years. And that's accumulation of resources through photosynthesis, usually put into a massive tap root in the first year and the use of those resources in the second year to make seeds and do, go through a flowering event and so on. Carrots and beets are examples of this. But the most common condition among all species of plants is to just grow on and on every year, to grow perennially. And those are, we, we call those perennials. And they, the way that a perennial plant actually survives being perennial is the formation of wood. There are some perennial plants, orchids and their relatives, some grasses that don't make any wood, but most of them make wood. And this is 90% of all plants that are perennial. And there are about 65,000 species of trees in the world, and they all make trunks and wood and accumulate wood year after year. And, and we can talk about what that actually is. Perennial plants can live for many years, and they be, can become very large and very old trees. What I'm showing here on the slide, these, this is the three largest single-stemmed organisms or trees in the world. That's the General Sherman on the left. Uh, the president tree right there in the middle and the general grant on the right. These, as you all know, are giant sequoias, 75 groves left of this species in Eastern California in the Sierra Nevada. And there are serious advantages to growing as a tree, to growing like this. What are the advantages of growing as a tree? Well, you can get huge and have a huge reproductive output. Massive numbers of cones are made every year on these, on these trees. And in the single life, of one of these giant sequoias, if you start to multiply it out and you say, how many cones does it make every year? How many seeds are in each one of those cones? And then how many thousands of years does it live? The, the answer is the reproductive output of these trees is like a trillion to one. One individual makes a trillion potential offspring in its lifetime. 
The next cool question to answer is, how many of those trillion actually become a tree in the next generation? And the answer is more often than not zero. It's mostly entirely reproductive failure. Many of them germinate and fail immediately. Many of them don't ever germinate because they're in the wrong conditions. So a trillion potential offspring is a real advantage though. It's an advantage and that's an advantage to being a long-lived large tree. And there's also trade-offs. In ecology, we always talk about trade-offs. What are the advantages and what are the problems? Well, the problems with being a long-lived old organism, some of you in the audience may know what I'm talking about. Just stuff comes out of the environment to attack you. Happens all the time and you get worse and worse and it's a downward spiral to death. I didn't know this was gonna be such a depressing talk. <laughs> It'll get more upbeat, I promise. But that's true. It's true of a long-lived organism that, that you have to deal with the environment that you've germinated in maybe even a thousand years ago and you're constantly being attacked by fungi. And so trees have these awesome mechanisms for compartmentalization, dealing with the environment that comes at it and really cool chem chemistry. The most complicated chemistry that we know happens in plants in order to keep things from those plants, keep those plants from being eaten in the environment. So here is the base of what's called the Del Norte Titan. Now we've moved to coastal California, and this is the uh, th this is the current largest known coastal redwood, not the tallest, but the largest by by mass. The Del Norte Titan outside of um, Crescent City in Del Norte County. And how does a trunk form that's that large? What are the patterns in its growth? How does it actually happen? Well, in order to answer that question, you have to go to the branch tips. You have to figure out what's going on at the branch tips. Now here's a, a, the same tree with drone imagery. Uh, the drone here is at 300 and uh, about 300 feet, somewhere around 300 feet above what you just saw in the previous photograph. And there right there at the tip is the tip of the Del Norte Titan. And that tip, has a growing stem in it. And the Del Norte Titan is a fascinating tree for, for a specific reason. I mean, there's a lot of old big redwoods, big deal, right? But the Del Norte Titan never lost its top. And there are some redwoods that exist like that, that they never lost their top. And so if you think about what that is, and redwoods are monopodial, it's a, it's a type of growth that this, this, uh, this tree would have in which it grows and it flowers off the side or it cones off the side. And then you have a single growing tip and that growing tip lives the entire life of that tree all the way up. Most conifers are that way. And so there's a meristem, a clump of stem tissues at the top of that tree that's 2000 years old that has been growing and dividing the entire life of that plant right up there. And what does that, what does that look like? Well, it's not, that's not the Del Norte Titans tip. That'd be very troubling if I had ripped it off uh, with the drone. But that's what, the, what, what a redwood uh, growing tip looks like. Right there at the tip there, that's where all the patterns associated with becoming a tree and, and wood growth and all of that and where the branches happen, that's where that's all laid down at that, at that meristem and sort of really understand this and look at it. We have to look at what is actually going on in plants in general and how, uh, how are the patterns set up for a tree to, tree to form. So if we look at plant structure, what you would call plant structure or plant morphology, there are some things that are true of all plants and everything is just a variation on this ancestral state in plants. And, and uh, let's talk about some terms. I'm gonna use some, use some terms as we go. And, and uh, one of those terms which is crucial to know about plants in general, because all plants do this, is they make leaves at a spot on the stem, which is genetically defined called nodes. Leaves emanate off the stem of a plant at nodes. And, and, and that's true of all plants. Everything you see out in the world is a variation on the fact that you have a node, a little space on the stem between the nodes called internodes. And, and, and leaves don't occur at the internodes, they actually occur at the nodes. It defines the node. And sometimes you have certain numbers of leaves coming off and that's also genetically defined. And at the tip of any growing axis, you have an apical meristem. The word meristem in plants means a small clump of stem cells that is undifferentiated and capable of dividing and becoming a lot of different things. All, the entire body of the plant is made by those stem cells in the apical meristem. But now here's also a crucial thing. Wherever a leaf is formed in plants, and I'm telling you things that are true of all trees, all plants, wherever a leaf is formed, just above that on the stem, 
And the angle between the leaf and where the stem is, is there, there's an area called the leaf axle there. There's a bud there as well. The axillary bud is what I wrote it there. And you can see uh, I labeled it here right there as the axillary bud. This is an awesome feature of plants because it's where all the action is. Any branches in plants come from the axillary buds. Every branch in any tree in the world actually came from an area just above where a leaf was attached at the growing tip of that tree. All branches are that way. And so, so this, knowing these themes, then you can see the variation on the theme and you can understand that, oh, you got modular growth going on. Node, leaf, bud, node, leaf, bud, inner node, all of that. It's modular growth in plants and it's a repeating pattern. So uh, meristems are where growth uh, occurs and you have several types of them. I'm going to start by talking about apical meristems and then we'll talk about lateral ones. But the apical meristems form this primary herbaceous non-woody growth that if you think about how a tree is growing every year, the shoot tips are pushing outward. The trunk is getting wider, but the shoot tips are pushing outward. Well, what's going on with the shoot tips pushing outward is that the apical meristems, the tip of every one of those shoot tips is pushing outward by growing new leaves, new non-woody growth for one year. And then the change after, after that first year becomes that wood starts to form and the, and the branches get wider and so on. We'll talk about that, but, what, but the tip of the growing tip of every tree is that pushing outward uh, uh, of growth caused by the apical meristems and also little branches starting to form by those, those axillary buds there in the leaf axles of, of new leaves on the shoot tips. So trees get taller because of this type of primary growth. Always pushing outward every year and, uh, and if you zoom in on that apical meristem, it looks like this. Get close here, and you can actually see cells. This is a slide prepared with a stain where you can actually see cells. And if you zoom in there, you can see the apical meristem of, is at the shoot tip. And what's going on at the apical meristem is this, it's, it's cells that are growing and dividing. They're actually growing and dividing relatively slowly because one cell divides and it produces two cells. One of those cells may just sit there and not divide for a long time, and the daughter cell will start to grow and divide and form new leaves. And you can see leaf primordia on the edge of there, but you can also see right there, right away, some of those stem cells are left over in the axle of, the, of those new leaves and leaf primordia, and there's the apical meristem of a lateral bud or an axillary bud. And if we zoom down and we looked at it from the top, it would look like this. And from the top, this is, this is a scanning electron micrograph of a shoot apical meristem. And there is the, the, the center where all of the growth is actually taking place. I'm sorry with four screens to be used on a laser pointer, but uh, hopefully you all can follow that. And, and then you can see these around it there. Those are the leaf primordia. And, if, and those leaf primordia are communicating back to the shoot apical meristem because they're making hormones and they're communicating back and the shoot apical meristem knows where the leaf primordia are then knows where the most recent one was formed. And so it knows where the next one is formed. And that's what sets up the pattern for how leaves are attached. A genetically determined developmental thing happening in the cells right at the shoot apical meristem of all trees right there is where, is where it's happening. And so if we went back to our giant redwood, and we went back to the shoot apical meristem of the giant redwood, we could start to see, well, how are the leaves forming and how are branches forming on this giant, giant redwood? Leaves are formed one at a time on that shoot apical meristem, and they're formed in a very specific genetically determined pattern. And I'm going to use the redwood as an example, but this could be, we could use the Kentucky coffee tree as an example, or whatever this random conifer is right here as an example. They're all the same. It's all the same. It's variation on this theme here. And if we zoomed out a little bit, uh, we, we would see that the first year's growth of a redwood or the shoot tip of a redwood growth looks like this. Already branches are forming. Well, where are those branches forming? And let me label that like this. So you can see where leaves are. There's the apical meristem. You can see those little scale-like leaves that are there. And you could also see the new formation of a branch. And that new branch, if you follow that new branch down, it came from a lateral bud or an axillary bud in the axle of a leaf. And it determines actually the branching pattern of a redwood because two leaves are never made at the same time on a, on a redwood stem. Therefore, two branches 
two branches are never made at the same time. And the pattern of branching is set up right here very early on. Different trees and different species make different numbers of branches at each node in each position. And when a tree branches, sometimes it branches with two branches, sometimes at one, and very rarely, very rarely with three. And why is that set up? Well, it's set up with this thing we call leaf attachment or phylotaxy. Again, genetically determined thing that happens at the shoot apical meristem. If you want to do, want to know more about an, a, a plant, if you want to know more about a tree, you should know the answer to this question right here how many leaves are attached at every position on the stem. If you walk up to a tree and you pull it down the stem and you see that, oh, there's two leaves attached there, you know so much immediately by that. You've been able to eliminate the fact that, oh, that's not an oak tree. I can see two little leaves scarred. Why, why is it not an oak tree? Because no oak tree in the world makes two leaves at one node. And, and, and if you saw that there's only one leaf attached, you know right away, well, it's not a maple tree. Why? Because every maple tree in the world makes two leaves attached at every node. And so this is actually a very important thing as people who care about trees and identifying trees and knowing about those organisms, that you would know the differences between these. And the words we use for, for one leaf attached, the most common, this is the most common, that, that, that legume right there, the, co the coffee tree that we just got the demo would have one tree. Why? Because all, almost all legumes in the world have that, have that situation, an alternate leaf attachment. Then there's opposite. There's two examples of two leaves per node. And then you have a rare condition where, where you get three or more leaves attached uh, per node. And so if we go back to the redwood example, let's look at it here. And we can take two redwoods and you can see the difference between two redwoods. There's the deciduous dawn redwood from China called Metasequoia glyptostroboides. And that, that thing is, um, it's grown occasionally in the urban landscape. And uh, then to the left is coast redwood or, or Sequoia sempervirens. They have different phylotaxy. They have different leaf attachments. Therefore, they also have different branching patterns. Uh, and if we look closely at what is actually going on on the thing on the left, it looks like this. So there's all the teeny little leaves. There's actually probably a hundred or more leaves on this photograph. And each of those leaves are, have in their axle, a teeny little axillary bud. Each one of those has the ability to form a new branch. And only some of them have. New branch formation is determined by hormonal growth and its distance from the shoot apical meristem, all kinds of complicated things like that. But each leaf, the, the bud in the axle of each leaf has the potential to form a new branch. And then if we look on the thing on the right, which is the meta sequoia, the Chinese dawn redwood. And we look closely at that, we see it looks like this. So, so a different branching pattern. You got leaves here and those leaves are made two per node. And th therefore when a branch happens, you, you could have two branches coming out at the same position, two branches coming out at the same position. Here's the leaves on the main stem right there. The, 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 the uncommon condition that I, that I told you about is called world. That's three or more leaves attached at every stem, uh, every position on the stem. And an example of that um, that I have here is oleander. There aren't very many of them actually in the world. Most plants are either alternate or opposite in their, their, their leaf attachment. So, so if we look at the redwood, then we know that redwood branches are always made one at a time, not true of maples. And I gave you the maple example of having opposite leaves. Well, if look, at, look, look at this, this is a big leaf maple and big leaf maple just breaking its bud. And you can see the bud scales are coming apart. The shoot apical meristem is pushing out and it's pushing out new growth. All leaves are produced two at a time. Even the bud scales are two at a time. Everything is opposite there. The, the teeny little branches on the right picture in my, in, in, my, in my fingers there, those two branches at once. And then if you went back to them, that same maple years later, you, would, you could see this. You could actually see this in its branching pattern. You would see that later on, the, air, the branches were actually two at a time. Some of them get lost due to the environment. Some of them get lost due to random pruning events. Uh, you know, they get lost, but the genetically determined developmental pattern is that two at a time, two at a time, two at a time. And you can actually, you could identify maples sometimes at 70 miles an hour as a car as you go and by just and it's deciduous just by looking at that branching pattern by that, that fact that it's opposite and so on. So leaf attachment on the twigs of trees is there as evidenced in each branch tip. 
And you can see the, the each year's growth as well. And you can see the, the branching on each year's growth and you can see um, the apical buds and you can see the axillary buds. If you investigate the, 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 the branches, you can see all of these things as well. And so that's going on all the time, every year as trees are growing at the shoot tips and we're calling that primary growth. So, for, uh, um, and remember primary growth, it forms new stems and leaves. It increases the plant length and height, and and, uh, and it happens at these apical meristems. Apical is, is just a positional term, meaning at the tip of something. Axillary is just another term, meaning in the axle of the, uh, of the leaves, but they're the same things. And, they, and as soon as an axillary bud grows out, well, you would call it an apical uh, bud at that point because it's the tip of a new growing branch in that area. And so trees get taller due to this primary growth which is happening at the tips. But, there, but there's another thing happening as well. And another thing that's happening is that every year when a tree is getting taller or getting wider or getting, get, getting more growth at the, at the tips, it's more leaf formation. It's more photosynthetic surfaces. There's more need for water every year. A tree can't make a bunch more leaves without having a bunch more xylem in order to pull, to pull for the water to be pulled up to those leaves so photosynthesis can happen. So there are constraints that are, that are caused by continual growth and perennial growth year after year. And, and if, you, if you're looking at a tree, you're really only seeing half the body of the tree. Estimates are about half, half the body, right? There's so much going on underground. We know, we know troublingly little actually about what's actually going on underground of most trees. Here I got the opportunity, this is a blue oak, a native species of oak to California uh, that had been washed out in a massive flood. And I got an opportunity to investigate very, very recently after, after that flood, what's going on underneath. And it shows what much of the literature says that many trees, they don't have a tap root at all. They got a pan root system. And the body of that root system is probably as large as the, as the body that you're seeing above ground. And there's this important relationship, obviously, between roots and leaves. Roots have access to water and leaves have access to light and both are required for photosynthesis. And they're in different environments often. In fact, the, the evolution of xylem and phloem the conducting tissues in plants is, is a, to deal with this constraint. Early plants in the world didn't have any xylem and phloem. Xylem and phloem actually evolved at a certain period of time in history. What did the plants look like before the evolution of this vascular tissue? Well, they laid across the ground. Mosses and their relatives, right? They're laying across the ground. Why did they have to lay across the ground? Well, because they get light. They're on the ground, but they can't get up above the ground because they have no, no tissue to transfer it above the ground. So, so wood, this xylem and, and bark, the phloem, is an awesome adaptation for a competitive environment in which light then becomes competitive and you can outshade things and, and, and grind towards the light and at the same time have access to the roots, uh, uh, have access to the water that the roots are giving you, maybe even 300 feet down. And that root leaf constraint is a fascinating thing uh, because if you think about it with palms, it gets very complicated. Palms don't get any wider. In fact, all the vasculature that's in a palm tree when it's this tall is all there. It's not gonna make new, new xylem and new phloem. It's, the trunk is not gonna get wider as it gets taller and taller. A, 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 a hundred foot tall palm has the same amount of vasculature as a five foot tall palm. How do they deal with it? Well, the answer is palms don't make more leaves. They actually can't. You can't have a big branch in a palm and have to make a bunch more canopy and all that. They just don't do it because they can't get wider in the process. So that, that and, and actually, and I studied this with a guy named Don Hodel in California. We looked at all the palms and, and it's, a, it's a direct correlation between the diameter of the trunk of a palm and the size of the canopy. The larger the, diam uh, the, the larger the diam diameter, the more surface area of the leaves. And as palms get older, and some of that xylem peels off to make flowers and, and, and all the fruits and so on, the leaves get smaller and smaller. The canopies of palms decrease as they get older and older and they go on flowering. Why? Well, why? Well, because they can't do what the next thing I'm going to tell you about, which is produce more xylem 
and more phloem, more conductive tissues in order to be able to, to, to furnish that canopy with the water necessary in order to do all the photosynthesis. And this is called secondary growth, called secondary growth. It also involves meristems, but these meristems, they aren't, they aren't clumps of cells that shoot tips or in the axles of leaves, they're cylinders. They're in the shape of a cylinder. Meristem doesn't need to be a clump. It can be, a meristem just means cells that are undifferentiated that continue to grow and divide. And so they can be on as uh, cylinders just inside the bark in trees. And there are two of them that I'll tell you about, the vascular cambium and the cork cambium. The vascular cambium and the cork cambium and will transition to secondary growth. And are you guys doing okay? Yeah? Do you guys need a pep talk? Is it too early for this, this much botany in this? Uh, you, you're doing all right, right? Yeah? Okay. It's hard, it's hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> This would be me asking people on Zoom, can you turn your screens on so I can see your face? But I can see your faces, some of you, and, and you're doing okay, I think. Um, yeah, question right there. Yeah, so the question is, am I gonna get back to De the Del Norte Titan? Sometime I'll get back there personally, which is gonna be wonderful. I won't get back to it in this talk. But your, your, the second portion of your question is, if, if what happens very commonly in trees in general is if the, the, it loses the top, what happens if it loses the top? Well, if, if I were to come over here and break the top of this tree off, right, and I do that, it's not going to kill the tree, not at all. And that's one of those awesome things about all those, the, those, those lateral buds, the axillary buds, right, is the fact that as soon as the, the apical meristem gets lost on a growing shoot, one of the lateral buds will take over. And many plants, actually, the shoot apical meristem will grow, and then it becomes a flowering meristem and dies every year, and axillary buds take over. The whole group of plants, the dogbane family, the opossinaceae, they do only that. They, they just... Do, do and 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 uh, other members of the sap and daisy, some trees we grow very commonly will flower at the tips every year, and then and then an axillary bud takes over. Magnolia grandiflora is a good example of that. Look at Magnolia grandiflora. Every year, it makes one of those big, beautiful flowers at the tip, and then an axillary bud takes over. So that is what what happens, and what will happen of, of, of at the Del Norte Titan if it loses it. And a lot of redwoods lose their tops and they're fine. They, they, they do well. So let's talk about secondary growth and the getting wider in the process of making more leaves. So if we, again, we have to look at the shoot apical meristem, but this is what we're gonna do. Instead of looking at it in just the first year's growth, we'll see what happens after the push out of the first year's growth. Now, now when that meristem moves on, let's, let's lag our attention back one year at the second year's growth. So what's happening one year back from this year's growth or two years back or three years back? What's actually going on there? Well, I have a number of diagrams to talk about that. And, and what you can see here is just cross sections going backwards in time from the shoot apical meristem. And, and what you see in the middle of that diagram on the right is a cross section of a young stem in which the vasculature, the xylem, which is there in red, and I'll remind you that xylem tissue is the conducting tissue that moves from the roots up to all the leaves and conducts water passively upward. And I'm going to later this afternoon, I'm going to talk all about water movement in plants. It'll be riveting. You guys should be here. <clears throat> xylem is in red there. And on all plants in the world, xylem is inside the second type of conducting tissue, which moves sugar, carbohydrates hormones sometimes from the leaves to other places, which is called phloem. And, and phloem there is in blue, always on the outside, xylem always on the inside. And, uh, and if you look what happens, well, what happens in the transition from, from a young, long, young plant, first year's growth to a woody plant later on? Well, let's go back now from the shoot apical meristem, go back one year. Well, what happens is there's a, a, a set of cells between the xylem and phloem, between these little bundles or packages of xylem and phloem, which they themselves are undifferentiated, meaning they're just cells that could become anything. They can grow and divide and they can make more xylem to the inside. They can make more phloem to the outside. 
And they eventually, after, after that second year, they connect in a cylinder. So that, that cylinder now of undifferentiated cells that's, that's growing and dividing, making more xylem to the inside, always more xylem to the inside, and a little bit of phloem to the outside, we call that the vascular cambium. And it's labeled there on this in, in, uh, in green. Here's that, that vascular cambium. You can see years one, two, and so on. And then when you, when you have xylem that's now no longer made by the shoot apical meristem, but the xylem, the new, the new xylem being formed and those stems further back are made by the vascular xylem. In books, they'll call it secondary phloem. Sorry, secondary xylem, which is the technical term for wood. Secondary xylem, xylem made by the vascular cambium is what we call wood. It's wood. And what is it doing? What is wood doing? Well, wood is there to conduct water from the roots up, up, up into the leaves so that some of it can be used in photosynthesis. If we look at that in actual cells in, the, in a tree, it looks like this, where you have the vascular cambium out on the outside. Here, wood is to the inside, labeled here as xylem. These are years of growth. And we'll, we'll get into that in a, in a minute. And then out here is all the phloem. This is where sugar and other carbohydrates would be moved throughout the plant from areas where it's being made to where it's being used. And then we, ha we have the cork on the outside, and I'll talk more about that. But the vascular cambium right there, the vascular cambium is the cylinder of undifferentiated cells that's growing and dividing. Well, what does it do when it grows and divides? It produces more of itself, for one, because if you think about a tree getting wider, the cylinders are increasing in diameter. The cylinders have to increase in diameter for more material to be pushed or, or grown towards the inside. So as xylem accumulates year after year, the vascular cambium also has to make more cells of vascular cambium to increase the, the, the diameter of that cylinder. Meanwhile, also, some of those cells are growing and dividing. And if they end up on the inside, they, be, they, they differentiate to a xylem cell, some cell within the tissue that we call xylem, and it could be several. And if they grow and, and, and divide and they end up on the outside, they become the phloem and then one of those tissues uh, uh, that is a complex tissue. But phloem comes from, in this case, from the vascular cambium and these undifferentiated cells then go through the process of differentiating into the phloem. So that's what's going on at the vascular cambium. Now you should think about a thing associated with plants as well. Our thinking often is so human and animal based that we have a hard time realizing some very fundamental things about plants. One of those things is that, um, and it doesn't seem very crazy for me to say it or whatever, but plants don't move around, right? Plants don't move around where they germinate. They're done. They're going to stay there for the rest of their life until something kills them or they die. Well, the same thing is actually going on in the bodies of plants. Plant cells don't move around where they're divided and where they're born from other cells, they're going to, they're going to stay there. So position is everything in plants. You, as I speak, have cells, human cells coursing through your body, leaving your body, uh, portions of your body to go to other parts of the body and so on. None of that is true of plants. Where they're found in the meristem, where they, where they divide off the vascular cambium, they're there. And so the position associated with the vascular cambium, whether the cell moves to the inside or the outside, is going to determine whether it develops, if it's in the inside to the xylem or to the outside to a portion of the phloem. And secondary xylem, we call that wood. And wood is a incredibly important, economically important, fascinating material. And all of the, of the, the, life history of a tree is there in the wood. It's all there. It's in a record in the wood. And there's also a record of the environment in which that tree grew in. And, and trees in temperate areas in which we have defined seasons, either wet and dry or hot and cold and variations on that, you get different speeds of growth of that vascular cambium and different sizes of cells that come off the vascular cambium. And if you zoom out to your eye, what those different sizes of cells and speeds of growth look like are defined rings. 
and we call those growth rings in trees. Well, what do we call, what are actual growth rings? Well, those are just different speeds of secondary xylem production by the vascular cambium. And, and, and all of the life history of that plant is there. Here's a Gary Larson cartoon where he says, uh, and see this right here, Jimmy, that's another one when this old fellow miraculously survived some big forest fire. Larson's joke being that, you know, 20 minutes with a chainsaw, you can do a massive amount of damage that took hundreds of years to form and the life history of that entire body there is, is, is in there. And you can see everything that's inside of it. And, and as the wood of the tissues and trunks grow over a pruned or lost branch, you can see this as well, that, that the branch will remain there uh, and that scar actually remains there for the remainder of the life of, the, of, the, uh, of that plant. It's another animal way of us thinking is that growth and repair happens so differently in animals, right? Some of you have been burned. Am I right? And you were like, you, you had some hot water do dropped on you or so you touched something hot on your hand or your finger at one time and you look down right now and that all that damage is gone. In fact, you have all kinds of injuries that have happened to you in your life where you have no evidence of that injury anymore at all. If it's a really nasty injury, you can have evidence of it in the form of what we call a scar. But, but, but animals are so different in that we have these moving cells and they move into an area and they can, they're developmentally programmed to recreate a thing that was once there. Well, plants aren't like that at all. They're not regenerative. They're generative. They just grow on and grow over and move on. And, and the, the results are still of that injury or the evidence of that injury is still there in the body. And, and as you know, Alex Shigo showed very nicely that, that how branch attachments to trunk actually happens and, and, and how cuts are made, either right or wrong, can actually affect because of the removal of certain tissues and because of the removal of vascular cambia, the ability for, for regrowth and compartmentalization to happen. You can see compartmentalization and the vascular cambium and bark regrowing on both of these things here. And so if we look at growth rings, we also can see things like, well, trees are not all growing at the same speed. And you can have different numbers of growth rings per some given area of the tree in which you would have large growth rings or small growth rings. You can tell if trees are suffering or not by the size of the growth rings or if they, or I don't know if the right word to, to use there is suffering, but whatever, they're, they're growing at different speeds. And that's, that's evidenced here in the upper right where you have uh, different levels of, of growth between, or different sizes of these different growth rings. Here I found a piece of, of of juniper wood here, there's a pencil that I took with that and it's got about a hundred growth rings per inch. And there, are, that's, not, that's not even a record there. There are some trees that, that have been known to have 400 growth rings per inch. It's insane, that's like barely growing year after year after year. If you look at bristlecone pine wood, you can't even see the growth rings on bristlecone pine wood without getting a 10X magnifying lens out to look at them because each year they're growing so slowly and putting on so, um, so little wood. So cell types in wood, which is what we're calling secondary xylem, are the, the cell types in xylem. Xylem is a complex tissue with more than one cell type in it. You can have trachids, you can have vessel elements, you can also have fibers, which is these long, spindly, very thick-walled cells that are, are found throughout plants for support. And you can actually have li living, thin-walled, cells that are capable of growing and dividing, parenchyma cells. Another thing that Shigo spent his, his career showing was that wood is actually not all dead. It can compartmentalize, wood, cells can grow and divide within certain portions of wood and, and, and compartmentalize things. And you can get recovery in what was supposedly thought of as a dead tissue. And, and, and the density of these different cells, the number of fibers, compared to the number of conducting cells and so on, determines the different qualities of wood. You all touch trees. You know that there are very huge differences in wood. When, you, when the chainsaw enters the body of certain tree, it goes right through it. Other ones, some acacia or something like that, it grinds on it and it takes some time and it's much harder. Well, that, that's because of the different types of cells and the ratio of these different cells that are found in the wood. You can have very dense wood, 
and you can have less dense wood and it's about the dense it's it's about the 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 cell wall sizes the number of fibers and um and a great example is to show you would be the 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 comparison between rosewood and balsa wood here's uh, on the left is rosewood uh, Dalbergia, Dalbergia sissos was grown in uh, dry areas in the southwest is a good example of a rosewood and balsa on the right balsa which you would go to the craft store and get that really light wood well the, the the density of the cells is much less both of these you can see that there are resin canals in both of them that's just a resin canal in both of these but you can see the cell density and the cell thick wall thickness is very different in those well that wood uh, the cells it, it, it laid down by the vascular cam and cambium actually determine the different way different qualities of this wood those living cells within wood, we call them vascular rays. And if you zoomed in on those, you would see that, um, uh, that not only are there cells moving up and down, so moving water up passively through, through wood or, or pushing water around through the bark, there are actually cells moving radially in a tree. Those are often living parenchyma cells with thin walls capable of growing and dividing. And if we look closely at those, they're moving throughout in, in this direction. And there's some vascular rays here that you're seeing on that, on that cut. Here's a section of a young oak tree in which um, it, it, this shows very nicely that wood is both dead and conducting open cells on the inside and living. And what you're seeing here is this is an iodine stain showing starch and living cells. And you can see all the vascular rays are living. And, and, and that's all the vascular rays are living here on the inside. And there's vascular rays here, which are we call xylem rays. And there's also phloem rays there on the outside connected completely between the vascular cambium and the inside of the tree and the outside of the tree. Material is moved in a transverse way in trees, not just up and down, but in a transverse way in trees as well. And, and those conducting cells are not always conducting the entire life of a tree. Cells don't remain conducting, a xylem doesn't remain functioning for the entire life of the tree. In fact, xylem can get old in a way in, in the sense that it no longer, you get, you get embolisms in it, you get all kinds of problems with it after a number of years. Well, these rays are moving material towards old xylem and they eventually will fill it up and they'll fill it up with tyloses and other, other extrusions into it that stop it from being able to conduct. Resins go in there, dyes go in there, and you end up with heartwood on the inside of a tree. And the heartwood on the inside of the tree is invariably darker because the, the dyes and tannins and so on than the actual conducting uh, sapwood towards the outside. So heartwood is no longer conducting water and the sapwood is still conducting water. And you've seen this when you've opened and looked at trees and that, and that is the, that heartwood is usually the material that is used in lumber. Heartwood has, has features to it that make it much more valuable than the sapwood with regards to lumber. Well, it rots less, it's, it's harder, it's, it dries in a different way and so on. And, and so when you look at lumber, and you look at the cuts of different boards in lumber, you can actually see vascular rays in lumber as well. If it's, if it's cut in a specific way, especially quarter sawn stuff, you've cut right through the rays in that case. And have you ever seen, and you looked at quarter sawn oak, the famous type of wood, what's going on with quarter sawn oak is that you're, you, you actually, the, the blade has moved through those vascular rays. And so you're seeing the rays that are moving tangentially in the tree and they've been splayed open by that cut. Here's a table I made recently out of sycamore and it's the same thing. It's got these crazy vascular rays that almost give it a checkered pattern here. Much different wood than the walnut that is in the butterfly key here is the, and you can see the vascular rays on the edge, particularly where they were cut right through. And, and the, the, another thing to mention is the characteristics of different woods is based on evolutionary history in the sense that you have different types of plants and they make different types of wood. There, there are, are a group of plants called angiosperms. These are flowering plants. These are all hardwood trees. They make flowers, they make fruit. Those are very different than gymnosperms. Gymnos, gymnosperms were on the planet before angiosperms At about 100 to 150 million years ago. Angiosperms evolve, they become very successful because of their pollination adaptations with, uh, with all the insects that evolved around the same time. And, and these trees have different types of wood in them. They've evolved to have vessel elements, a much wider 
larger type of conducting tissue than the trachids that are found in conifers and their relatives. And both of them have fibers, and, um, but those fibers are more common and abundant in, in the angiosperms or the hardwoods. And here's a look at hardwood, wood on the left and softwood, wood on the right. Again, hardwood and softwood are just terms which are actually evolu evolutionary taxon taxonomic terms, meaning conifer wood and flowering tree wood, oak and maple and so on, and, and the flowering trees on the right. And we're comparing here, uh, uh, sorry, we're, the flowering trees on the left, we're comparing here red maple and dug fir. And you can see how uniform the wood is of dug fir because there are cell types that exist in the, in, in the, the, in the red maple that don't exist in the dug fir because the dug fir only has these long spindle shaped trachids for conducting water. These two groups of plants, the hardwoods and the softwoods, they bear their weight in branches and trunks very differently as well. That, that evolved differently. Where, now look at this figure, we're talking about reaction wood here. How does, how does wood form differently when it's under pressure from weight and gravity? In both of these things, you have a conifer on the left, which is leaning to the right. And so the load is being pushed in that direction. And you have a, a hardwood or a flowering tree on the right in which the load is in the same direction. Well, conifers make reaction wood in the compression side. In this case, in the tree on the right, it's in the lower right hand, uh, the, the lower right hand side of the tree. Sorry, the tree on the left is on the lower right hand side of the tree. It's a lot of right and left, sorry. And then the hardwoods, they make tension wood. They area away from the load. And you can actually tell that when you cut open a, 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 a tree or you make a cookie off a tree if, that has been leaning in one direction, the center of the tree is not the center of the rings. Why is that? That's because that reaction wood is formed during the leaning pressure portion of the life of that tree. And, 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 and you get differences in that because of these two different types of trees that evolved at different types at times on the planet. Okay. Tom, I have 10 minutes, am I right? Okay, I got the thumbs up. In the last 10 minutes, probably not even that much time, I'm gonna talk about the second vascular cambium. I, began, I mean, the second cambium. The, the, I began this a while back by saying that you have these growths at the tips, which are caused by shoot apical meristems and lateral buds or, or axillary meristems. Meanwhile, you have cylindrical type meristems that are making the tree wider, producing wood. That's the vascular cambium and, and the phloem. That's what the vascular cambium is doing. Well, at the same time, just outside the, the phloem, the living phloem on a tree is a second cylinder. It's an interrupted cylinder because it's not a, not a true cylinder, but it's called the cork cambium. And it's making the outer portion of the bark the part of the tree that you touch when you walk up to a tree and you touch the bark, you're making, you're touching cells, which are called cork cells, that are the result of the growth and, div and division of the cork cambium. And so if we looked at a tree like this from the inside to the outside, we got all our secondary xylem there or wood on the inside, just on the outside of that is the vascular cambium, just outside of that is the phloem, and just outside of that is another cambial layer called the cork cambium. It actually develops from cells of the living phloem. Some parenchymous non-divided cells of the, of the living phloem are capable of de-differentiating or not becoming phloem and going on to produce these specialized cork cells towards the outside that produce the very external portion of the bark. And the cork cambium, as shown here as a cylinder, is actually very inaccurate. Cork cambia are rarely cylinders. They're patches. A good way to think about cork cambia is patching in which you get a little patch of growth. And then right over here is another little patch of growth. And over here is another little patch of growth, all forming that cork on the outside of it. Well, and you, if you think about the physics of that, it makes sense. This cork, the cork on the outside, it's dead material. Those cells are not expanding. They're actually hard, dead, often filled with, with waxes that are protecting the tree from the outside of the in, inside. Well, a tree is growing in diameter. What's gonna to happen to those dead cells is they have to tear apart or the tree will stop growing. And so that's why bark is, it, it has all these crazy patterns associated with it and often cracks in it where you get down in that crack 
and you would see living cells way down in that crack of the cork cambium, but the outside portions, the plates, they are dead and they're cracking apart and bark on the outside of a tree, the external bark, it cracks apart in all kinds of different ways. And here's three examples. On the left there are those puzzle piece like, uh, like, like bark of a ponderosa pine. The middle is a similar puzzle like pieces of the different patchwork of a cork cambium growing and dividing at different times and different ages of that cambia of a Chinese elm in the middle, middle, and there's a rainbow gum, Eucalyptus deglupta. If you've been in, uh, on vacation to Hawaii, you might've seen that tree and in which you have very different colors of bark. The, the cork cambium and the cells divided right off the cork cambium of a rainbow gum there on the right are actually green and they very quickly weather to orange and then red and then ultimately to, to, to gray and then they peel off. Well, if you see all those at once, you get that rainbow patterns. Same is true of the two, two trees that, that are there as well, is that it's patchwork of different growth of, of cork cambia at different times. If we zoom in on that, look at it here. Right down here is the vascular cambium. There's wood on the inside. Out here is the secondary phloem. And then just outside of that, would be where the cork cambium is producing these cork cells to the outside. And you can actually see growth rings. You can see the annual growth of the cork cambium as well and the formation of different patches of bark. You could count this up and you would know how old that cork cambium is based on the number of individual segments that it made over time. It's all there in the body of the tree. And, and you can also see uh, some certain things that these broke apart and these these were not a, a uniform cylinder and they grew and developed and initiated at different times. And I said that the cork cells are, they're dead, they're not expanding, they're impregnated with a wax that's called suberin in most species, and they're, they're impermeable. Impermeability in a tree from the outside to the inside from the, the, the brutal external environment to the really nice moist environment of these cambia is crucial. Impermeability is crucial. And so how does a tree maintain that impermeability while still growing and expanding is making new cork cambia all the time and sloughing off all the material to the outside and keeping it impermeable. But there's also a problem with impermeability in which you don't get gas exchange. And gas exchange is crucial. Those are living cells in the cork cambium and vascular cambium. They need oxygen actually in order to respire. CO2 is bubbling out of the tree, out of the tree and out of leaves and so on. But the cells of the of the cork and vascular cambium are respiring. They're breaking down sugars, and, and oxygen is being released from them. And you can't have a buildup there. So that the way that trees deal with that are tears, specific tears genetically determined tears in which certain cells of the cork are made that aren't so square, but they're more round. And, and spheres don't hold together as well as boxes do. And so spheres tear apart. And the tearing apart of those spheres in very specific areas, we call those lenticels. And lenticels are, are so genetically determined that, that you could see a two square inch picture of certain trees of their bark, and you would know instantly what species that is. You could know members of the rosaceae, the rose family, cherries and all their relatives very quickly. And you could tell those apart from, from uh, other species based on the way their lenticels are formed. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing two members of the genus Prunus on the right and a, a, uh, a birch on the left, Betula. So if we go back to this, that's the cork cambium that I just talked about, that area in dark gray towards the outside, producing these cork cells. There, uh, there uh, you have, uh, again, heartwood, sapwood, vascular cambium, living phloem, or secondary phloem. We're gonna talk about the, the xylem and phloem this afternoon and how it actually works. Why does the phloem have to be living? Why can xylem be dead? What is going on there? How is sugar and water moved around in trees? Well, then just outside that phloem is what, what people call the outer bark. The outer bark is just the cork cambium and the cork cells to the outside of it. And there is, there is one species 
there aren't very many species of trees in the world that are like this, but the cork cambium can actually be pulled off. And you pull off the cork cambium and you pull off the, the, the cork cells to the outside of that and you don't kill the tree. It doesn't girdle the tree to do so because the way you girdle a tree and kill a tree is by removing the living phloem and the vascular cambium. It's done at that point if that happens. But you can remove the cork cambium and the cork of a specific species. And this is the cork oak, Quercus suber. Here you see it being harvested in Portugal in which these people were yanking the bark off the, the entire tree. I should, see, should say they, they aren't yanking it off. They're doing it in a very specific way. These are the highest paid agricultural workers in the world. And they have very specific ways and times when you do this. Well, what's the, associated with the timing is there is a period of time when the cork cambium is really growing. And for a quercusuber in the Iberian Peninsula, it's during the summer. And, it, and when it's really growing and all those cells of the cork cambium are filled with water, you can put a, a, a very special type of hatchet in there and peel it off and peel off the cork cambium and the cork on the outside of that and leave the living phloem on the tree. And it makes the tree orange and a little ugly for a little while, but big deal. New cork cambia forms from the living cells inside that phloem. So some of the parenchyma cells in the, in the phloem, you get a new cork cambium forming. And after 10 more years, you'll get new bark formed. And these are harvested on a regular period, sometimes generationally harvested. There are corks, cork trees that are known to have been harvested for over 300 years. Every 10 years, the cork cambium and the cork is taken off. And if you look cl closely at what actually gets taken off, it gets to be about an inch and a quarter in thickness after 10 years. And it'll continue to grow, but it doesn't make economic sense to let it continue to grow because the, 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 the rings in the, in the cork get much smaller and smaller and you're not getting as much cork. But to do it less than that would, would, would also you, not make economic sense because it's growing really fast for the first 10 years. And then wine corks are taken out in this direction. They have to be taken out in this direction. Well, why is that? Because if you took them out in the other direction, a lenticel would be going all the way through that cork. And you would get gas exchange and, and even liquid exchange, and, and it wouldn't be a good bottle stopper at all. And, and so it has to be perpendicular to the lenticels in order for you to get that cork off. Well, where's, there's the cork cambium on the inside. Here's the outside of the tree, the cork cells. And if you looked at these, you could actually see 10 growth rings inside the cork of that. And so, with that, I'll do a summary for you and, and say that the, uh, here's what I, I covered, that the leaf and, uh, the, and root constraint is solved by making new conducting cells as ion and phloem. Wood formation is due to the activity of the vascular cambium. Growth rings, they vary, and they vary um, due to differential growth of the vascular cambium, not only at different times of the year, but also different species growing at different speeds and different environments. And then you have the character of the wood is based on the actual cells inside of that wood. Hardwood is much different than softwoods and, uh, evolutionary, evolutionarily. And then cork cambia form these um, dead protective cells on the outside of bark that we call cork, but it's made by a meristematic cylinder-like thing, which is a bunch of different patches, as it turns out. And I also began this by introducing myself and saying that I, one thing I do is translate the natural world to people and help people understand what is actually going on, what's the literature associated with this. I'm available to you from now on out. Unfortunately or fortunately, you can Google me, you can find my email immediately, and you can ask me whatever question you want. And I'm responsive. I am not a social parasite in the sense that I'm just a professor that does nothing for industry. I actually will answer your questions. So I'm fine interacting with you in that way. I'm fine interacting with you for the rest of this conference in any way you want. I, I, part of what I've done as well is try to get very young people stoked on trees. And, and <laughs> somebody laughed like, 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 that's a hard job. It actually is, right? And, and, and the way to get young people stoked on trees and very young people stoked on trees. There's many ways to do it, but, but, uh, but you tell them cool stories. I think that's one way to do it. And then they realize that, oh, a tree isn't actually an organism. It has a life history. It's doing things. And so part of what I've done is, is write books to do that. I have a brand new children's book out. It just won the National Book Award for Outdoor Books. And it's called Something Wonderful. I'm going to sit 
at lunch and different times out at a table there. I got books for sale if you're interested in buying one, if you got grandkids or children or something like that. It's the fascinating story of how fig trees reproduce and interact with other organisms in a tropical rainforest. And with that, I'll say thank you. And I don't know if I have time for questions, but yeah.